We continue worshiping today through listening and through interaction of the word. And so uh, I told you we're right at the beginning of this Take Heart series. And you're going to see a lot of information about this through the next several weeks. Uh, and I want to talk to you about today, kind of an introduction to it. Um, but I want you to be paying attention to things other than on Sunday morning, okay? Don't you know the church is here right now, but when we leave this building, the church is leaving the building, right? And so, um, and so we want to be engaged in these kind of things throughout the week. I believe this series is going to uh, speak to you because it's already been speaking to me. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret uh, on the, uh, don't tell anybody, but on the first night I interviewed with uh, the search committee, uh, I was listening to this song that we just did. And I felt like God said, that's the, that's the series we need to do when you first get there. And I was like, well, Lord, that, that hasn't happened yet. And so, um, so, you know, maybe he, and then he said, just in case, just in case. Uh, so, uh, you know, Lord was speaking early on. And, and, um, and so I try to be a good listener to God, right? Um, my parents are here, so I'm just going to tell you, I was a great listener as a child. Um, and so I try to be a good listener as an adult. Uh, but we want to be listeners to God, right? Uh, God is always speaking. It's just whether or not we are listening. And so we want to be listening to him. So uh, as some of you have already uh, been uh, talking to me, you, uh, some of you have been like, like communicating to me and just telling me how excited the next season is all about and all of that. And, and I've had a few people say that, that God really ministers to them through uh, the memes that I use. Uh, and so if you don't know what those are, you're going to learn quickly because I like to start uh, my talk each week with a few things that get us thinking and laugh together. So here's my first one. When my papa shows memes in church. This is Sophie, and Sophie you'll see a lot of. I've got five grandchildren, and all of them, uh, four of them have come in the last uh, 18 months, 19 months. And so this is Sophie when she's a little bit younger. Uh, but we have some memes that have lasted through times, uh, like they kind of keep her still in, in time. And this is one of them. I think the next one, let's see if I got the next one here. Uh, this one is a different face of hers. Uh, this is when the worship team doesn't play your favorite song. <laughs> you ever feel like this? Uh, so this, this is going to live in infamy, this picture of Sophie. And one day she's going to be old enough to hate me for this. So uh, I got to use it when I can. Let's see that next one. Uh, the oranges in my fridge watching me take out another Kit Kat for desserts. <laughs> you like, yeah, yeah. Some memes you got to let sit. Because some of y'all go, what's that have to do with oranges in my fridge? And then, you, and then when you're driving home, they go, oh, the net. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next one. Sorry, I get lost in these. Uh, whoever's making cheese commercials can save their money. We're buying cheese, and we're never going to stop buying cheese. <laughs> Come on now. Y'all like, I don't eat that much cheese. Yeah, you do. All right. I swear people go to Starbucks and just say random words. Uh, let me get a grande ice mocha, no foam, quad soy, hexagon vortex hypothesis with steamed ice. <laughs> Finally. That's a rough crowd this morning. Hey. Like, impress me with the way you read the things. That's what I want to see. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, where can I find a microwave that doesn't beep so loud and let my family know I'm eating again? <laughs> it's funny because it's true. So uh, talking about uh, Take Heart, and uh, I actually seriously have a meme that I believe uh, describes how some of us feel these days. Uh, Ray prayed a minute ago, and he said, you know, that some of us are excited today for different reasons, and we all get excited in different seasons, but, uh, but some of us aren't. Some of us just have the heaviness of what's going on in life and what's been going on in life, and some of that's because of the collective mess that we've been in in the last several years. Some of it's just because of individual heartache and all of that. And so this meme really speaks to me. Let's, let's look at this one. Uh, my bedroom fan that's been running on high nonstop for three years. If you don't sleep with a fan, something's wrong with you. So I, this is how I feel. Um, because sometimes we just feel down, wore out. We feel dirty. We just don't have time to keep care of ourselves, and, and, and that's one of them. And, you know, even ministry can be very taxing on people. Uh, I, some of us cover it up really well, like this next guy. Uh, I think I got one more here. Uh, who said pastoring a church is stressful? I'm 42 and feeling great. You feel that one right there, Ray? <laughs> Y'all didn't know Ray was 35, did you? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people feel tired sometimes? How many people feel more tired than you used to feel? 
and it's probably not just because you're getting older. We've been through a lot. And as I was praying for you, because I, I, I'm part of the South Texas district where, where I pastored in Beaumont, uh, that church was part of that. And so uh, this is a unique move for a pastor to move on the district. Um, but it's kind of cool because uh, first of all, I know a lot of you in here, you know, Bernadette and I go way back. I've aggravated her a lot before I ever got here. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's cool to see people that we know and, and the staff are friends with a lot of the staff here. Um, and, you know, you tend to pray for those people that you work with and your, your, your cohorts with. And so I've prayed for, for Living Word. I've prayed for other churches on this district for a long time. Um, but specifically, I've prayed for you since we've been planning and praying about what would happen next for our lives and yours. And, um, you know, just what really just came onto my heart real heavy and in my mind and in my emotions is that, you know, you've, you've been without a pastor besides your interim pastor for a year. That's a long time. And so when you couple that with other things, right? So some of you have had, you know, loss in your family this year. Some of you have had job transitions and uncertainties, accidents. Uh, maybe through the season of, of COVID, you've, you've been sick and maybe you know people. I was in the outreach class for a little bit this morning and I heard people sharing prayer requests from people who, who are, are still dealing with COVID and, and in the hospital and things like that. And, and so we have things individually that weigh us down. We have things collectively that weigh us down. And uh, I, I'm extremely excited. I've got so many things that go in, in my heart and my mind every single day about what's next. And, and that's kind of how I think anyway. Like it doesn't have to just be about church. Like uh, you guys, some of you guys are really excited about football season, right? College football started this weekend. And to me, when I, I love college football because what that means is that college basketball is right around the corner. That's what I love about college football. And so I'm always anticipating things. But sometimes when you anticipate and you're looking ahead and all of that, Sometimes you miss the now. And sometimes you need to just embrace the now, even if it's hard and even if it's heavy. And I think especially if it's hard and heavy. Again, I think that's why we need church. Like the, the church was God's idea, not the district superintendents. The church was God's idea. Matter of fact, it was plan A and there is no plan B. And so... Do you think when God designed the church that he thought it's going to be the best, always the best, and never any problems? No, of course not. But he says, take heart. Because I've overcome all those things that might weigh you down and feel heavy and all of that. I've, movies are some of my favorite things. Some of you guys have seen The Green Mile, a big old dude in that movie. He says, I was tired, boss. And some of us feel like that. We're tired. And so I'm not going to come in here pretending like, you know, everybody's on top of the world and, and it's just going to be victory in Jesus forever and ever. Amen. We always have victory, but God created our emotions. He created our mind. He created our bodies. He is not just interested in your spirit. He's interested in your whole person. And so when God says, take heart, he's not just talking about being on top of the world spiritually. He's saying, take heart because I've overcome. I have given you hope for things to come. We've all seen trouble in life. I remember when I was really young, a friend of mine named AC, I got a picture of her on the, on the screen this morning. And uh, Larry and AC were uh, really two of my uh, just most influential people in my entire life early on. Mentor in ministry was her husband. He died way too early. And this is her son-in-law, uh, Mark, right here with her. And, and AC was just always smiling. She's a beautiful lady. She's just a great mother, grandmother, great grandmother now. And, um, and I remember when, when I was first uh, hanging out with AC, AC never had any problems, at least I thought, right? Because she always smiled and she always just had the most positive outlook. And I remember one day I saw AC in a boot and it wasn't like because she had bought new boots. It was because she had a problem with her foot. And I remember seeing him, we were talking and, she, and I'm like, what's, what's wrong with your foot? And she goes, oh, I fractured it. And she used to walk every day in her neighborhood and, you know, that was her exercise. And, and, uh, but she would even say it with a smile. She'd go, oh, I fractured my foot. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I want to be AC when I grow up. And, uh, 
And I remember talking to her about this, and, and I thought, oh, somebody broke their foot, you know, she must have been doing some kind of activity, falling off of something, whatever. And I remember thinking to myself, what happened to AC? And here's what's crazy. Here's how she broke her foot from walking. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, and I was in my 20s. Well, I was actually just 20 years old. And I thought to myself, I thought you only break down when you do something crazy. Not, I didn't know your bones break down from just doing normal. Now, nowadays, if you ask me, I'll tell you a little different, right? But I thought to myself, like, I can't believe just regular life can wear down your bones. Has anybody ever said to you or you've said, man, I'm tired to the bone? Like, it's because, like, we get worn out all the way down to the bone. And that's like a physiological thing. Like, like our bones can just mess up just from doing our regular activity. And so what that tells us that life can be difficult and we don't need to pretend like it isn't. But we need to remember that we serve a God. We walk with a God. And not only do we walk with him, more importantly, he walks with us. And he knows our bones are going to be brittle. He knows our outlook's going to be down sometimes. And yet in all of that, he says, take heart. I have a couple of scriptures I want to share with you today. One of them is in John 16, These two you're going to see a lot in the next few weeks. And this one says this. In this world, you will have troubles. Don't you just love when you read the Bible and it just encourages your heart so much? In this world, you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Who said this? Jesus. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. It was in a context of a, of a lot of things he was saying to his disciples, getting close to the end of his time as, as in human form here on earth. And, and, he, and he was talking to them, and, and really he was saying collectively, you will have troubles. It's always interesting to me that when we have troubles, oftentimes we're surprised. Right? I can't believe. Well, we should believe that it happened because Jesus even said we're going to have troubles. But he also says, take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, one of my very favorite verses that talks about take heart is the other one that is the theme of this series. And it says this in Psalm 31, 4. Be strong, take heart, all who hope in the Lord. Now, at certain times during my sermons, I will encourage you to have your phones out and take pictures of what's on the screen. Or just write something down, you know. If you want to use a pen, welcome to 1992. You can use a pen and write things down too. You can put a digital note in your, in your phone. And this is one of those. If I were you, for the next little bit, I would have this verse somewhere where I can see it every single day. Be strong. Take heart. Those who hope in the Lord. If all we have, though, are just little snippets of encouraging words, I think we do the Bible disservice. These are very powerful words, but what if that was it, right? The Bible is not just a self-help book. Like, it will help yourself, right? You better help yourself for your record. You need, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you. But that's not just like, you don't look at a word for the day and just say, oh, that's it. Like, okay, now I got to live all day just on this one word. Which, by the way, if any of you guys use the Bible app, I've been freaked out so much lately. Since I started talking to uh, the board and all about coming here, uh, they've been telling me you guys have been praying Romans 8, 28. Um, and all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, called according to his purpose. What a promise that Paul writes. And uh, I, I don't know about you, Ray. I haven't been able to get away from that verse, like not even trying to read it. It's just been showing up. And then today, I don't know if you know this, today out of the Bible app, that is the verse of today. Today. You guys have been praying that verse. That's the verse for today, yeah. Also, if you're a really weird number guy, today is August 28th, A28. I'm just saying, uh, that's weird, right? Y'all been praying. So y'all could have saved a lot of heartache and say, oh, it's gonna happen on 28th of August, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. But even that, that verse is powerful, but that's not the only thing that Romans 8 talks about. 
Like there's this huge passage there that's so rich, and we're not going to talk about it today. But what I want you to understand is that there's context to everything you read. And so if I wrote a book, and you took one line out of one paragraph and boiled down my whole book to one line, man, I hope you picked the right one. Because it's probably not going to be very fair. And so that's why people get mixed up because they'll see some one line and they'll think, oh, I'm supposed to be rich because it says this one thing. Or, oh, I'm supposed to be poor because it says I'm supposed to this one thing. Or, oh, I'm supposed to be well for the rest of my life because this one thing. Or, oh, I'm supposed to just sell everything I have and give it to because of this one thing. And that's not how the story of the Bible works. And so Psalm 31, there's this history, this context of the writer. And if you know anything about David, you know that this guy poured his heart out about things that really mattered. And if there's nobody you can relate with, I bet you can relate with David at some point in his life. Because we get to see an entirety of his life. And not only do we get to see the story of his life in other books, but in the book of Psalm, we get to see him pour out his heart on paper. We get to see him and hear him write songs about things that really matter and that we all can relate with. And in Psalm 31, when, when Paul, I mean Paul, when David wrote this, he was writing, be strong, take heart for those who hope in the Lord. Not because he was thinking about you. He was thinking about him. He was in trouble. There were so many times where David was in trouble. And this could have come like right after he dodged another javelin, right, from Saul. It might have been when he was hidden in a cave in the wilderness, holding his breath. His soldiers were walking by because they were hunting him. It could have been easily that he was running away from Jerusalem at the Jordan River, having been dethroned and disgraced and insulted and accused and betrayed. And there were times when he was attacked, even by his son Absalom. And by his advisors and even the people he ruled, knowing that one day they were trying to come and kill him. There were so many times when David was in trouble. He was disheartened. And we believe this particular time is a time when he was running for his life away from King Saul. God had anointed David for what he was supposed to do. And that impacted Saul's life and his kingdom and really his ego more than anything. And David was running from Saul. And so in the context, and I want to read some of this uh, chapter to you today. Because there's fear and there's trembling and there's despair and there's defeat. Anybody feel those things sometimes? Did you know the Bible has places where you can relate if you feel like you're in despair and defeat? And so in this moment here. He feels those things, but he bows down helplessly before his God. And he says these words, look, in verse 1. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Remember, he's running for his life. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock and my refuge. You can feel him crying out to God. He said, God, be a strong fortress to save me. Verse 3 says, since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. In your hands I I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Verse 9, he says, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul, my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones... My bones grow weak. Verse 14 says, but, but I trust in you, Lord. Let that sink in. All that we just read, man, it it hits heavy when you read those things. He says, but I trust in you, Lord. And I just, I just read it like he's saying it like that. He's not shouting out, yeah, I trust in you, Lord. Life's terrible, but I trust in you. I I feel like he's saying, 
My bones are weak. <sighs> but I trust in you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. And then he said, I say, I say you are my God. I, I say, I say, you are my God. I think when he says that, he's like having to tell his mouth what to do. You ever, ever faced with that? You might not feel it in here. You got to tell your mouth what to say. And what he chooses to say is, you are my God. Then he says, then he says, verse 23, love the Lord, all his faithful people. The Lord preserves those who are true to him, but the proud he pays back in full. So, be strong. Take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Doesn't that verse feel, look, sound so different in the context of what we just read? Yeah. It feels very different. And when someone who describes his troubles like he does there, when that person tells you to take heart, then it sounds like it's coming from a, song, a strong source, doesn't it? Like if somebody just told you, hey man, be strong, take heart. And you don't know anything they've gone through. Sometimes we assume they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know how hard my life is. And David just told us how difficult things are for him right here. And in the midst of that, he says, I trust you, Lord. I'm going to be strong and you should be too. And take heart, those who hope in the Lord. This verse goes deep. It speaks to a faith and a trust that we must have when we are in real relationship with God through Jesus. Something personal. This verse is like we understand that God knows us. That in our relationship with Jesus, that it's not just this fictional thing or something that we hope is real in the end, but it's something real and that Jesus knows your troubles. He knows our hurts. He knows it's good for us to have full faith in him. He knows that's what's best for us. My dad is here today and his name is Harold and uh, I've told their story a lot through the years and, and I'll talk a lot about them as of my time here because they've been super influential to me but they gave their heart to Jesus as adults and my dad got a call into ministry a little bit later as an adult and I remember growing up hearing him talk about a writer and a theologian I think he was introduced mostly to through his school and studies there's a guy named W.A. Criswell and this guy says this he talks about the kind of faith that we have by comparing it to an operation. If you've ever gone into an operating room, you know the procedure. If you've ever had surgery, you go in and the anesthetic is administered usually by a mask. And Dr. Criswell explains this. He says, they tell you to count to three and you'll be out. They put the mask over your face and you think to yourself, that gas is never going to be able to knock me out. And you confidently count one, and then you're out. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Some of y'all are having like flashbacks. You're like, oh, I don't want to. In that moment, you're like as helpless as a newborn baby, right? And in thinking about that in our relationship with God, like it's this idea that in that helplessness, it's not only the committal of our lives to God, it's the full trust and it's funny how in regular life we will commit full trust to a surgeon. We're open to just whatever happens in that moment is going to be good, right? And in our relationship with God, like there's more than just this committal. Like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to, to save me. I know that I've done things that separate me from you, but, but I, I, I just need your salvation and your grace. But it's more than that. This, this, this understanding and this forth putting of, of that I'm going to trust you, God, fully. And in doing that, what we actually do is we abandon other things. 
Like when we fully trust God, there's an abandonment of other things. And we hear that even in David's voice, if we can imagine his voice speaking that psalm, that it's not just this full trust in God, but this abandonment of all those other things that are weighing him down. They're real. I'm not pretending like they're not there, but those things aren't going to hold me. They're not going to grip me, that they're going to be things that I have to abandon fully in order to fully trust God. And that's what God is asking you to think about today. This abandonment of any kind of hope in anyone else other than Jesus. And the reality is, church, sometimes we look a whole lot like the world in what we trust. Now, I know we're really good at pretending like we don't look anything like the world because we can measure that through entertainment choices and, and clothing that you wear and all that stuff. And we've done that for a really long time, as, even as a denomination, a long time ago. But the reality is, oftentimes, if we are not intentional about the ways that we think and how we interact, we will often look just like the world in specific things about what we actually trust in. You know how I know it? Because oftentimes many of us will say things like, well, now all I have left to do is pray. We're peculiar people. We pray first. But that's only if we fully trust God. We have to abandon the things that give us security sometimes. Like we're like, well, if I got enough money, then I don't even need to trust God till I'm out of money. That looks a whole lot like the world. I don't want to find my security and my confidence in the same things that the world finds it in. I want to be abandoned to those things. It doesn't mean I'm not smart with my finances and I don't plan well and all of that. But don't you know the the proverb says, "In, in our heart man makes the plans, but God orders the steps. And so there's this idea that we are fully abandoning the other things. And here's what I think grips us the most. I think we have such a hard time abandoning worry. And if you think about it, how much worry goes on in the everyday average world and how much worry goes on in the everyday average Christian looks a whole lot the same. And all I'm here today to tell you is that that shouldn't be the case. I'm not here to to shame you into changing your mind. I'm here to say the Bible, Jesus, God, through his messenger, David, he's trying to help us understand that is not the best way to live. And many times we can abandon a lot of different things and say, I trust you, God. But then we sit and continue to worry and have fear and the things that grip our mind. And when we're alone and we don't have other good voices speaking into our lives and we sit there and we contemplate and we like, oh, I got to be smart. I got to be, you know, responsible. And I got to think about these things. Oh, I'm so worried about this. Oh my gosh. And I feel like God, our father is sitting there going, hey, I'm over here, I'm I'm right, I'm with you. You don't have to carry that yourself. That's another thing, that's one of the most important things that you can be abandoned to, to just put full trust in me, but you've got to abandon the things that weigh your heart down. You cannot take heart and have your heart heavy with things like worry, things like fear. What we're talking about here today is just a complete resignation of ourselves to Jesus. It's not just about emptying myself, it's emptying myself towards something else. We have to decide there's nothing else. There's no one else to turn to. You will find that I'm very passionate about this. Because when we abandon those kind of things, we begin to concentrate less on the unimportant parts of life, or at least the less important parts of life, and we start fixing our eyes on the most important part of life, and that's the way Jesus has called us to live, which is the best way to live. And all of a sudden, we are loving people in a better way. We're looking at our day differently. We don't need somebody to come give us a a spiritual boost for the day. We're looking to God for that. 
And then when we gather like this and we assemble, whether it's on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning with kids all over this place with sports, or whether it's at a food bank serving that we're doing, or whether it's in our second service with our Spanish-speaking friends, or whatever it is that we're doing, we have a collective power because we are all taking heart and we are thinking about the main thing being the main thing and abandoning the less thing. Amen. Come on, give him praise for that. It's okay. If y'all need help, I'll tell you when it's good preaching and you can agree, okay? There was a time when Peter was, you know, we always give Peter a hard time because he had a loud mouth, right? But sometimes he had a loud mouth in the right situation. And there was a time when Jesus was talking to his, his friends and followers and he said, everybody's left me. You guys going to leave me too? You remember what Peter said? He said, where else do I have to go? He said, I've already left my family. I left my job. I left the fish. I left all those things for you, Jesus. I have nowhere else to go. And he was giving us a picture of this abandoning all those other things. And the reason he had to abandon them is because they were just most important in his life. And you look at Jesus' interaction with people, they didn't all abandon the same things. They just all turned to the same one. And so what looks, diff you know, what you need to abandon is different than what I need to abandon. But I do know that worry and fear, it grips us, mostly all of us. I take heart because my hope is in God. The verse said, be strong, take heart for those who hope in the Lord. It doesn't say be strong, take heart, those who can pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Be strong and take heart for those who can make all their money on their own. Be strong and take heart because you've lived a long time so you probably know better than somebody else and you'll, do, you'll, you'll be fine. It doesn't say that. It says, be strong and take heart for those who hope in the Lord. I hope in the Lord because I really believe there's just nothing else that compares. Now, do I live like that every single day and every morning I wake up? No. I know I'm supposed to, but I don't. I'm real too. But if this is part of my life, and it's something that I remind myself every day and then I put verses in front of me like I just gave you to do that. And I don't think I saw anybody take a picture. I'm so disappointed in y'all. If I put, uh, good, good. I hear you, bro. I see that hand. All right. We're going to start oxygen next. I got $30, $40. All right. Listen, when we start putting that stuff in front of us and we start thinking differently, it becomes more of a habit. Do you do your habits every single day? Probably not. I'm not going to tell anybody if you actually forget to brush your teeth one day. Sometimes it might happen. But it's such a habit for you, you would be shocked if you got to work and go, oh my goodness, I forgot to brush my teeth. And everybody else would be really upset about that too. But we create these habits and I want to create this habit in my life where I take heart because my hope is in God every single day and I have to remind myself and I'm like David and I say, I say you are my God. I trust you, God. I know things are not like they're supposed to be. I don't understand why this happened, but I'm not supposed to understand everything that happens. I have a 19 month baby grand, uh, grandbaby and she doesn't understand that if she gets too close to this edge, she might hurt herself. She has no intention of hurting herself but what she doesn't know she doesn't know and so we don't know everything and we need a God that will say ho oh, ho just turn around come back over here because this is what's best for you right here I know you love living on the edge but I'm going to bring you right over here because this is my path for you so that you understand what it's like to trust me fully and I have what's best for you I take heart because my hope is in God nothing else and what gets in the way of hope is worry what gets in the way of hope is worry. It's why we can't receive these words to take heart. It's likely, you're going to catch yourself, but it's likely at some point tomorrow, you're going to find yourself worrying. And you're either going to go, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to do that. You go, Freddie. 
but you will. Because the enemy of your soul wants you to worry because worry is in the way of hope. And if, God, if the enemy of your heart can get you to worry enough, you'll be so distracted by that that you will not be able to put your hope in God. And if you can't put your hope in God, then you will not take heart. If you cannot take heart, you will not be strong. And then you'll make bad decisions and then you find yourself overwhelmed with life in the world. You may have heard of Corey Ten Boom. If you haven't, you should look her up. There's books written about her. There's books she's written. There's a radio broadcast that she had, and that has even been turned into transcripts. And there's a book written uh, called Reflections of God's Glory, and it's all about her life. She helped save Jewish people from the Nazis during the Holocaust. She hid them in her home. She was arrested. She ended up herself in concentration camp. And in the midst of all that, we have a story of somebody who just understood what it was like to have their hope in God. Can you imagine how much you, I'll just say me, can you imagine how much I would have worried if I was in a concentration camp? I would have been overcome with grief. I'd have been worried about hiding people in my home. Y'all don't know my girl Isabel, but she, she'd have been like, dad, we can't do this. She's a rule follower. And if we'd have been in Nazi Germany, she'd be like, we can't, I love them, but we can't just, it's too much to handle, we can't, right? And, and that's how most of us are. Like we look at that and we're like, oh, this is an amazing story. But could any of us really done that? And I think that what we learn about her through the rest of her life, we see why. One of her most famous sayings, and I think I have it on the screen here, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Now, if you're like me, you might need to read that a couple times. Comprehension's a little slow. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. We act like it does. We're like, oh, if I worry about it enough, maybe tomorrow's sorrows won't come. I think oftentimes more comes. What it actually does is it empties today of the strength that we have. Here's from uh, one of those radio broadcasts. She said, once I had a burden that weighed heavily on me. Now listen, she said, I set it down and I looked at it. I've got a couple burdens here today. She said, I took that burden and I, I set it down. And she said, I, I looked at it. And then I saw that everything about my burden was borrowed. One part belonged to the following day. And one part belonged to the next week. My burden was huge. And it was a huge, stupid mistake, she said. I realized that worrying is carrying tomorrow's burden with today's strength. It's carrying two days at once. <laughs> it's prematurely thinking of tomorrow. I know what some of y'all say, but Freddie, I'm a planner. I got to have things set out. I got to plan. But think about that. I don't think there's anything wrong with planning. But man, when it turns to worry, all of a sudden you're playing all these scenarios out in your head. And you look at that problem, you're like, oh, but what if this happens? Oh, man, what if she says this? And what if I look like this and I don't look good enough? And I, oh, man, what if I go on Instagram and I see that thing right there and I, just, I don't have the, com the, the thing to compare to that? And all of a sudden I'm thinking all about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And that's what Corey Ten Boom says here. She said, the Holy Spirit does not give you a clear blueprint for life, but he leads you from moment to moment. Worried people, she goes on to say, are like tightrope walkers, balancing between hope and fear. In one hand, they carry a bag with, dis, with a disordered past. They carry that disordered past all around. And sometimes they put that down because they use the other hand to worry about a feared future. Worrying does not take away tomorrow's grief. It takes away today's strength. And many of us carry these things around and, and we add 
we add to our life and we're walking around life and I know I'm going to walk out of the light here, but if I were to walk around this place and these bags are really heavy and I go through here and there's wires back here and I don't know what, oh, I got to be careful because not because I'm of wires, but because I'm thinking about my yesterday and I'm thinking about my tomorrow and I'm thinking about what's going to happen when she sees this and when he tells me that and I got this at the job, but look, I used to be this kind of person. What are they going to believe about me? And then tomorrow I don't have the education that he has and how am I going to get that promotion because I, I'm not as qualified and, and what about tomorrow? My kids kids the kids are just a mess and it's because of my past because I made bad decisions now my kids are a mess and then what about tomorrow when they're 18 years old they're not going to be prepared for life anybody stressed out right now because I am I mean don't we do that to ourselves when I do it like this it's like well that's silly but when we do it and somebody tries to help us we're like you don't understand what I'm going through David felt like that. We feel like that. Do you know why? Because we live in a broken, fallen world. We need something bigger than ourselves. We shouldn't just want it. We need it. And God loves you so much that, first of all, he gives you people in his love letter to you to relate with. So that when you're doing these things, you don't think, oh, I'm the only one. I'm just messed up. You go, wait, the guy who, who killed animals as a shepherd boy, the guy who, who became king, the guy who, who was one of the, the most brilliant like a person that led armies and, and kingdoms, that guy struggled too? Yeah. But in the midst of all of that, he said what we know is best and what we cheer him on for saying, but rarely do we grab it and make it our own. And that is, be strong. Take heart. Because your hope is in the Lord. If I'm doing this and walking around all these places, you know what I look like? I look like everybody else. And Jesus came so that we wouldn't have to look and act and feel like everybody else. As a matter of fact, he wants everybody to feel and look and act like just like him. And we know that Jesus didn't do this. We know he wasn't burdened by the past or in fear of the future. We know that. And even he himself said, hey, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome your tattered past. I'm in charge of your fearful future. <laughs> this is why we can take hope in the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me? As we close out today, I just want to give you a moment to rest. Give you a moment just to sit. Give you a moment just to be calm. Give you a moment to gather your thoughts and, and ask God, God, help me to be strong. Help me to take heart. Help me to know that my hope is in you. And that is the goodness that we've sung about today. That's what we encounter when we encounter Jesus. Would you rest in that just for a moment?
sing that with me. Sing one more time, all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. Our hope is in you, God. You're good. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am in, I will sing. our heads and pray just a moment this morning and I encourage you to leave this place today to still be a listener to God and ask him what he wants to talk to you about speaking to your heart over these next few weeks as we start a new journey together my dad is a pastor in South Carolina and he's going to come and pray for us as we leave this place just pray a blessing over you today just let's contemplate on what we've heard and believe this today that all our life God has been faithful if you're sitting beside somebody close that you know and love, maybe you want to grab their hand just as a sign of unity. Even if you want to reach across an aisle and grab the hand of somebody, it's okay to do that. Let's just be in unity this morning as we pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord, that when you, you said to cast all our care upon you, for you care for us, Lord, that we have nothing to worry about if we could just put our hands and heart in you, Lord. And you care for us. And Lord, I pray that this, this church will be blessed. I pray blessings over, this, uh, over the pastor, over the worship leaders, over the ministers, over the staff, over the whole church, Lord. I pray that this, this church will flourish and will be a beacon and a lighthouse of God, Lord. And I'll give you glory and honor, Lord. Lord, I believe you're fulfilling things that you had shown me many years ago, Lord. And I thank you for this church. I thank you for you, who you are in our life, Lord. And we'll give you glory and honor. And Lord, I pray that the people will go out of here and will be blessed and will be excited about coming back next week and bringing people with them. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give God praise in this place. Amen. You are dismissed. I'll see you soon. God bless you.